getting a little bored with the snacks I've been eating lately. And so last week I challenged myself to test out a new snack idea every day. Th they're not new, new, like new to me. These are from different parts around the world. Some I bought, some I made myself. Little disclaimer, many of my variations here aren't always the most traditional. You know, I tend to like to improvise when cooking sometimes. And also some of these snacks aren't originally plant-based and so I kind of had to find a way around that. We interrupt this program for an important news announcement. So I'm hosting my first book meetup pretty soon. It's happening in New York City out of all places, early November. And I would love for you to come. If you are around and you'd like to join, definitely send me a DM telling me you'd like to come um, because then I can get a rough idea of how many people would show up and really get into planning mode. I'm thinking of either doing this at a cute little cafe or a restaurant, or maybe we could meet at a bookstore. On Monday night, I was craving something crispy and spicy, like samosas. I'd always associated samosas with India or South Asia only, but they can actually be found in many more parts of the world. Across the board, it's usually some sort of crispy, savory filled pastry. First, I boiled some potatoes with the skin on until cooked through. Then I cut up a yellow onion and let it saute inside a medium-sized saucepan with some oil over medium heat for about six minutes. Meanwhile, I cut up this green chili here, which I was a bit scared of using, but since I'd removed the seeds first, it actually gave off the right amount of spice, um, for me at least. I also cut up some garlic and ginger and then added all that to my onion. Not sure if this is the right spice to use, but it says it's for vegetables, so that's why I picked this one. I'm also adding a bit of agave plus vinegar here, some salt, and then I let everything cook and caramelize for another two minutes. Then I added some frozen peas. Those take another two to three minutes to defrost. Once the potatoes are cool enough to be handled, with your hands, um, peel them, and then mash them up with a fork. Add the green pea onion chili mixture to this, as well as some fresh cilantro or parsley. Mix all this together, feel free to add some more salt and a bit of melted vegan butter. The butter is optional, but I would not skip it. Since it was very, very late at night at this point, I took a bit of a shortcut here by not making the pastry dough from scratch and using my friend the rice paper instead. Grab a round rice paper sheet and dip it into room temperature water for about five seconds and transfer that to a cutting board. Cut it in half so you have two half circles and I'll simply add a heaping tablespoon of filling to one corner, flip it once, flip it twice, flip it three times. And to close it off, pinch the edges together with your fingers and repeat with all the other potato bites. Make sure the uncooked samosas don't touch each other though because they will stick together. Bring a nonstick skillet with vegetable oil or coconut oil up to medium high heat. Add the rice paper bites and allow them to crisp up for about two to three minutes on each side. And then serve! Oh, that's right, I also got some actual real samosas. They came with this Indo-Chinese chili filling. But yeah, I really like both. Okay, so someone asked me to make vegan bounty. Sure, it's not a traditional snack with a century old history, but why not? Not really sure which country or region I can assign this to, but I guess the US? Even though bounties are apparently no longer sold there you just need a handful of ingredients. In a small saucepan, melt down some coconut oil plus some vegan butter. While that's happening, combine the following ingredients, desiccated coconut, and here I'm already starting to improvise, adding some cinnamon, also a pinch of salt, some agave, and the melted fat. Last but not least, I also added some vegan whipped cream, I noticed the batter becoming a little too wet, and so I balanced that out by just adding some cornstarch, which, you know, helps to soak up any liquid and it kind of binds everything together even better. 
you just grab a handful of the batter and press it into bounty shape. Huge shout out to Anne Louise. She did such a good job shaping these. Let them rest in the fridge or freezer while you go ahead and melt the chocolate, whichever way you prefer. I'm doing the oven method because I still don't have a microwave. Last but not least, cover your bites in the melted chocolate. I kind of underestimated the amount of chocolate I would need for all of these though, um, which was okay because I ended up just drizzling what I could over the second half. And then you can dig in. You can store them in the fridge for like up to a week and in the freezer for up to quite a few weeks. A couple of months, I would say. Wednesday morning was very wholesome. Artemis had the idea to pick up these handmade mochi from a farmer's market. The person making these is, from what I've heard, pretty famous on TikTok these days, which is why we try to be one of the first people in line. And then we had a cozy brunch on a Wednesday. We tested out Emma Chamberlain's vanilla matcha here. But yeah, these mochi were absolute killer. You can tell there's just so much love and work in these. So that that inspired me to, to give mochi making a try of my own with no mochi experience and no microwave. In a heat proof bowl big enough to fit into your steamer, combine some glutinous rice flour with salt and sugar. Then slowly pour in the water, mixing everything thoroughly I read somewhere that you should wrap your steamer lid in some kind of dish towel to prevent the condensation. The condensation! To prevent the condensation from dripping into the bowl. Now bring the water inside the pot up to a boil and allow it to simmer over medium for 15 to 17 minutes. And then every few minutes you give this a mix with a rubber spatula, scraping down the sides of it. In the meantime, grab a sheet of parchment paper and dust it with a little bit of cornstarch. I accidentally left the mochi dough on the stove for a few minutes longer than recommended. I think I left it there for 20 minutes or so. And so this was a bit more on the stiffer side, but that was actually okay. I sprinkled this with a little extra starch. And then once I felt like it wasn't gonna be so hot that I'd burn myself, I quickly flattened this out with my hands. Then I switched to a rolling pin, which was also covered in starch, flattening it out until it was like four to five millimeters in thickness. So, so we're making daifuku. My big mistake here was cutting out squares that were a little too small for my strawberries. I cut out, I think seven squares, five to six, would have been better. I still managed in the end, but yeah, this is where I made things a bit harder for myself. I'm, I'm prepping the bean paste here. I love the flavor of red bean paste. A practical tip is when folding the mochi to, to use dry hands, otherwise things will start to stick to your hands or just everywhere and that can be messy, like, <laughs> like with this grapefruit one here. Then serve immediately or store them in the fridge for up to a day. On Thursday I made another sweet treat. Alfajor is this little sandwich cookie treat that exists in all types of variations and can be found all over South America. I let my friend Ima judge these. She's from Peru and she said they're definitely close but not as dry as the original, which I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> to a large mixing bowl, I first added the powdered sugar, the cornstarch, flour, salt and baking powder. Gave that a quick mix. And then I added some semi-melted vegan butter, plus a little bit of applesauce, which works as an egg replacement in this recipe. 
Also, for more fun flavor, I added some lemon zest. I mixed this up with a spoon until it roughly came together and then transferred this to my surface. When kneading, I noticed that the dough was a, a bit too wet, so I worked another half a tablespoon of extra flour in there. You just gotta feel it out. Like, if it's too dry, you can butter your hands a little bit and work that in. Once you have a nice and smooth ball, place it into the fridge for at least half an hour. Once you're ready to bake, make sure that you've got a parchment paper lined baking sheet ready, plus the oven's preheating to 180 degrees Celsius. Now roll out the dough on a lightly floured surface until it's three to five millimeters in thickness. Bake these for 12 to 15 minutes or until they become golden brown along the edges. Some of these are a bit more ambiguous looking because I also just shaped some cookies by hand and then allow them to cool completely. Use this time to make the filling. To a medium saucepan, add some soy-based cream, some sugar, pinch of salt, and some vanilla. For some added richness, mix in a tablespoon of vegan butter, though that can be omitted. Bring this mix first up to a quick boil, and then allow it to simmer over medium for about 25 minutes. After the 20 minute mark, you will notice the mixture turning dark golden brown. But yeah, just keep mixing. And then just before taking it off the heat, add one tablespoon of cashew butter. That really brings everything together and it gives you that nice gooey texture that we want. Next, build your sandwiches. Feel free to afterwards dip them into some shredded coconut or some chocolate chips. I really enjoyed these, especially dipping them into coffee. So Ima and I, we went to this vegan donut place that day and I took some of the cookies with us. The reason I needed to go to this donut shop specifically was their merch because I wanted to put together the most amazing wedding gift of all time. So um, two of my friends who are obsessed with this donut place were going to get married that weekend. Yeah, that, that, that wedding happened to be in Switzerland. I didn't have the time and the space to cook that day, um, so I took this opportunity to try and find some snacks at a Swiss grocery store. There's an infinite amount of amazing looking, ridiculously expensive snacks at this store. A few of which I bought and sneaked into a movie theater later that night. I don't know why, but going to the cinema alone has always intimidated me. It makes no sense because I, I go to restaurants and cafes by myself, I've been to concerts by myself. For some reason, going to the cinema has always been this social activity in my head, which it isn't. I think it's the least social activity there is. So yeah, I challenged myself to do that and it did feel a bit awkward at first, but in the end, I did have a great time. Like, really, no, nobody cares if you're by yourself. Saturday was wedding day. After the ceremony, we had vegan pizza for breakfast. Did I mention it was a vegan wedding? Yeah, it was a vegan wedding. Yeah, it was just a really, really fun event to be a part of. And then a couple days had passed and I was in the mood to make empanadas. Um, similar to alfajores, empanadas can be found all over South America and the south of Europe. Some believe that empanadas are an adaptation of samosas, which isn't that a nice tie to the beginning of the video. I think this just became a video essay. <laughs> To make the dough, grab some vegan butter and cut it into little cubes. We need the butter to be cold, so place it back into the fridge while you measure out your other ingredients and set up the food processor. Add the dry ingredients first, give that a quick pulse, just to combine everything. And then add the chopped cold vegan butter and the water. And then just let it blend until a dough forms and then you can take that out and give it a quick one minute knead with your hands. Wrap this up in cling foil or parchment paper and place this into the fridge for at least one hour and for up to two days. 
my choice of filling was inspired by fajitas, but also by what I could find in my fridge. So first I sauteed some chopped baby bell peppers plus olives in a bit of olive oil over medium heat for six to eight minutes. Then I added some tomato paste, followed by my spices. That was coriander, cumin, chili flakes, and pepper. A splash of red wine went in there all of a sudden, brought everything up to a quick boil, allowing the liquid to evaporate for the most part before adding the rinsed black beans. I seasoned this to taste with some salt and then set that aside. Now onto rolling out the empanadas. Grab a golf ball size amount of dough and roll it into an actual ball with your hands first and then on a lightly floured cutting board, roll this into some kind of a circle. It does not need to be perfect at all. Add one and a half to two tablespoons of filling per empanada. Less is more. I learned that from my mochi experience earlier. Although there is always space for adding a sprinkle of vegan cheese, fold over one half of the dough, kind of enclose the filling first. And then if you want to get extra fancy, twist the edges inward. I'm not sure if I have any good clips showing you how to do this properly, which is why I'm going to insert the video that I looked at in preparation for this. I will also have it linked down below. Place your empanadas on a baking sheet with parchment paper. Make sure you've got the oven on, make sure it's preheating to 200 degrees Celsius and then brush the pastries with some non-dairy milk or non-dairy cream before they go into the oven for 25 to 30 minutes or until nice and golden brown. If you enjoyed this video, click thumbs up. I always forget to say this, but yeah, if you're still watching, click thumbs up. I'm also very excited to see your recreations over on Instagram. Again, make sure to follow me over there to get updates on future book meetups. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. I will talk to you very soon. Bye. Stop, boy.